السلام علیکم و رحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ اوکے گائز ٹو دے ور گن ڈسکس اٹس اے وائلڈ کارڈ نو ڈفرنٹ دین وٹ وی بین ڈسکسنگ ان پریویس اپلوڈس کنسرننگ سرن الونگ ود سرن دیز ائی مین دیز ا ٹریو دیٹ گیوز گیوز می کنسرن اینڈ ہیو ائی فیلٹ دیٹ دے ورک دے ار ورکنگ ان کہوٹس ٹوگیدر اینڈ دیٹس سرن ان سوئٹزرلینڈ then you've got the international space stations uh, those are all of them mm, that are up there uh, uh, with uh, nasa at the helm and then you've got um um uh, quantum computing now this is jordi rose and you'll find out exactly how this basically lends itself in and there seems to be a very significant connection between the three um uh, again it's uh, uh there's a there was a fantastic upload which um um explored the possibility of tearing through veils uh, dimensions as it were uh using cern uh, and the technology that they are dabbling with over there uh, in order to uh, tear that dimension the veil of that dimension and um 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 almost um merge uh, the uh, entities from that dimension and bring them across uh, into our reality as it were anyway um uh, it's it certainly it is it is a lot to digest and um uh, although if you were a muslim uh, and then it's it's not it's not a uh, Uh, so difficult to believe simply because it's very the quran you know the kalam of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is very clear about three uh, 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 creations one of which was made by a light and that was the angels the angelic angels then one made from smokeless fire and those were the jinn as we believe uh, satan لانت اللہ علیہ ابلیس لانت اللہ علیہ ازازل لانت اللہ علیہ has been created from the same element which is smokeless fire At least, uh, this is our islamic position and then mankind humanity adam was formed from earth so the element uh, that created mankind was clay and the quran is very clear about this now also we understand that the uh, jinn species um ha- coexist with insan with mankind um uh, in uh, the same reality but a different dimension so, so we share a same physical not a physical plane but the same existence so they're around us they are interdimensional beings and it's these very same interdimensional beings that i think that will basically um uh be part of this extraterrestrial contact that they're staging and we're seeing that anyway in certain instances where you see these um flashing orbs of light uh, being seen up, uh, darted across the globe uh, documented uh, the footage even making the mainstream media in some instances uh, sometimes the tabloids uh and then this whole mystery around the ufo kind of um culture that we see and um as far as i understand it and a loss of hanwa ta'ala certainly knows best but i think they're demonic beings who are basically um uh shape shifting and almost from their dimension um pop, uh, uh, stepping into our dimension and um uh, uh presenting themselves as um uh benevolent uh, beings of light uh, and we're seeing that we've seen that in um uh, Jerusalem recently where over the dome of the rock and it was recorded from se- several different angles so it wasn't just one had it just been one angle and one individual then it could have been written off as a hoax but uh, it was recorded uh, uh, by several uh different cameras and different individuals from different uh, creeds different backgrounds um at the same time from different locations within Jerusalem um hovering above the dome of the rock 
and then shooting back upwards. And we've seen uh, very similar instances everywhere else as well, uh, uh, notably near the obelisk, I think in Washington as well. And uh, it's very interesting how you, uh, even where they kind of appear, these kind of um, entities, uh, it's it's very interesting and you can glean a lot from that and learn a lot from that and you can, uh, again, there's, there seems to be a pattern uh, that the, a discerning eye would pick up. Anyway, moving on, uh, that reality, at least for Muslims, is a very real one and we've discussed uh, and uh, there was a, a very good uh, presentation done by uh, <coughs> Gen6 uh, uh, and I uploaded that uh, and we kind of explored that a little bit uh, uh, about the possibility of them trying to tear the fabric of these dimensions and this is where this individual um, uh, Jordi Rose from D-Wave uh, let's just listen to what he's got to say and then we'll discuss it further as we move along together and this one is really exciting to me because what they're going to do is apply this machine to an area that I think is fundamentally important it's the crux of our future as humans. And that's, can we build machines like us? So, building machines like us might be possible. I certainly believe it is. I might be wrong. Okay, first of all, there's a lot of mention about building machines like us, and then you'll see all this transhumanism, and then a lot of talk about uh, AI, artificial intelligence, and there's been a drive pushing that as well and merging that with humanity and you'll see that kind of virtual reality right now we've got our kids living it as well with uh, their heads stuck in their iPads and their iPhones uh, even with this whole kind of trend and uh, 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 that's uh, surfaced with Pokemon you've seen that this kind of almost virtual reality and how we become part of these kind of uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's literally tearing down uh, the fabric of uh, society uh, and uh, that human interaction, as it were, we're losing that. It's uh, it's almost like ostracizing the individual, isolating them uh, to a very uh, uh, polar reality. Uh, and um, there's a, a, a huge push for that, uh, especially for this AI. Now, my concern right now is um, this individual just talked that the, uh, the, the, what he's discussing here, Jordi, is that the technology that he's tinkering with and um, exploring and researching and developing has been basically is being done in partnership with Google and NASA okay uh, uh, and it's an AI lab okay artificial intelligence let's just very quickly I'm sorry I'm going to just take you on a very very quick detour we'll come back to it straight away just bear with me a second but um, um, first of all let's talk about Google okay and um, let's go to Google Google Chrome. Now, this is just for some of you who aren't averse uh, uh, to um, this sort of knowledge, and um, we'll just very quickly uh, uh, um, explore it. Okay. Now, Google Chrome, you'll probably be basically see first of all um, uh, four colors. These four colors, we'll talk about it in a second, they're called the cardinal directional colors. In Freemasonry, it plays a big part. You'll also see six, 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 okay? Um, I'll just show you now CERN's logo. CERN. Logo. Again, reference to six, 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 okay? Now we'll quickly dip out of this and we'll go on to the cardinal directional colors that I just mentioned to you. Now in Freemasonry, um, the cardinal directional colors, Freemasonry cardinal directional colors, come on, not now. Okay, brings out this particular image. Now, these uh, the cardinal directional colors in Freemasonry basically represent the elements and other stuff as well depending on what sort of message they're trying to communicate to the initiates and uh, the um, uh, the uh, 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 the fraternity, well, uh, communicating to uh, uh, the members of their fraternity. What you've got over here, at least, is the red and blue. 
Now red representing fire, blue representing water. Now remember they're both opposites and what we discussed before that for them at least at the heart of their belief system is the two polar opposites and how you combine them two and that creates the divine. Uh, divinity in more sense instances is white which is yellow in this instance and you'll find yellow and white are basically interchangeable but it basically means the sun, spring, obviously birth, spring is a time of birth, right? and then uh, uh, air, okay? so uh, understand, the star from the east, there's a reason for that okay, when uh, uh, there's references to that, when they uh, refer to that the eastern star and then uh, uh, I'll take you now to NASA and their logo. Now remember the colors we first of all mentioned is the two opposites, the blue and the red. Okay. Now what else you see is basically the circle. And the circle represents the soul again and it circles round, orbits round this. Right? But I want you to note the, 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 this particular um, chevron as it were. Okay. And I'm going to take you to something else which is quite interesting. You see? So literally it's, uh, and now we know that the snake represents um, uh, 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 Shaitan We understand uh, even in biblical references that that's what the snake represents. The Islamic uh, uh, reference that I've read upon, from what I understand, and this is very limited knowledge, but still, uh, from uh, if I, uh, you know, recollect from memory, I understand that um, Shaitan Lanadayale took the form of something similar to a snake, but there, he, he had flight as well as um, and this, uh, uh, this creature, uh, the form of which you took, uh, also had legs, okay? At least that's the Islamic version, but although very, very similar to a snake, right, in form. Uh, 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 and um, then you've got, when you look at the snake's tongue, and then you look at Nasser's um, uh, logo, and then you uh, look at the reference to the cardinal directional colors and the elements they represent, and how the masonry is all about the opposites, then you see what NASA and their logo basically does mean <coughs> in the occult world. Okay, now we've discussed already Google and the cardinal directional colors. They've, they've basically got all of them uh, within there. Within there. But that says something about the hierarchy as well of these particular institutions, okay, and where they are uh, in terms of the hierarchy. Now I'm going to take you back to um, uh, these guys. Uh, uh, what um, geordie has got to say about quantum computing. But what I do know... And how they're working together with Google and NASA. Oh, ...is that the types of approaches that people are taking now to build intelligent machines benefit immensely from what this machine that we've built does best. So what this center is about is applying this beautiful new computational idea in the service of trying to make intelligent machines. Now, I can't think of anything personally any cooler than trying to use quantum computers to build intelligent machines, so this is very exciting to me. Steve Jurvetson has been a longtime uh, friend and investor in the company, and for those of you who don't know him, he's a uh, Silicon Valley investor who's probably the smartest VC that I know of, and certainly the one that's the most attuned to technological trends. He's a uh, He's on the board of SpaceX, Tesla, Synthetic Genomics, which is Craig Venter's company that's trying to build uh, artificial life, and D-Wave, and that's it. And this is his particularly poetic way of framing the difference between the machines we build and conventional computers. This is what they look like. There are two of them. These are from our lab in Burnaby in British Columbia. From the outside, they look like giant black monoliths, big metal boxes, about 10 feet on a side, 12 feet tall. And they are powered, they have a fridge inside them, a refrigerator that cools these chips to almost absolute zero. Just a wisp, a fraction of a degree above absolute zero. Hundreds of times colder than interstellar space. Amongst the coldest and most isolated and extreme conditions that humans have ever been able to engineer. These fridges, interestingly enough, which are called pulse tube dilution refrigerators, have a thing called a pulse tube, which emits a sound roughly once per second, which sounds eerily like a heartbeat. 
So if you're sta you have the opportunity to stand next to one of these machines, it is an awe-inspiring thing, at least for me. It feels like an altar to an alien god. It, they really are impressive. Let's hear that again. Thing, at least for me. It feels like an altar to an alien god. It, they it feels like he stood in front of an altar to an alien god. Okay, remember that uh, these are these are very choice words and descriptions being given here, uh, uh, and they're deliberate. Okay, remember how we understand the Antichrist, the Jalanthalali, will claim to be um, God Himself, and then uh, uh, I want you to basically. Um, um, remember what we're trying to allude towards in terms of the extraterrestrial card agenda and contact that I understand they're going to be staging and I also firmly believe that when Dajjal Lanatulale makes his grand appearance the Antichrist he'll claim extraterrestrial origin really are impressive machines at the heart of this big box is a tiny chip about the size of your thumbnail and on this chip resides all of the wonder and magic that makes this thing go. I'm not going to describe in any mathematical detail how it all works, but let me give you an analogy. In quantum mechanics, there's this concept that an, a, a, a thing can exist in two states which are mutually exclusive at the same time, quote unquote. And I'm using those words because the English language was developed before we had concepts to describe what these things actually are doing. But I'm going to give you a, a, a roundabout way of understanding this. Imagine that there really are parallel universes out there. And now imagine you have two that are exactly identical in every respect, all the way out to the horizon as far as we can see down to the last little atomic detail of every single thing with only one difference. As Muslims in Islam we've been clearly told that there's a parallel dimension to ours and that's the one where jinn kind reside in and it's a replica of our reality and their reality is very similar to ours where they basically exist just like we do, right? Just like we appropriate uh, they do just like we run, uh, we have a lifestyle, we also do. And uh, there's, there's, uh, there's evil and good within those uh, uh, entities, just like there is within uh, humankind, right? And this individual is talking about a, uh, two parallel realities coexisting at the same time, um, uh, stretch out from uh, one, uh, opposite, one end of the spectrum of our horizon to the other end. And that's the value of a little thing called a qubit on this chip, which is a contraction of quantum bit. And that qubit is very much like a bit or a transistor in a conventional computer. It has two distinct physical states, which we call zero and one for bit. In a conventional computer, these are mutually exclusive. That device is either one or the other, never anything else. In a quantum computer, that device can be in this strange situation where these two parallel universes have a nexus, a point in space where they overlap. Do you hear that? So literally the point where it comes together. So let's think of a figure eight. And if you're making a figure eight, there's a point in the middle, in the center, where the two merge and come together. That's, a, that, that's basically, if I was to give you an analogy of the nexus uh, of two uh, dimensions, okay, coexisting. One would be our reality, uh, uh, the alim wujud for insan, and then there's the other reality, the other dimension where jinn kind basically exist. And this is the the dimension that I'm genuinely um, uh, concerned that they're trying to basically um, tear uh, uh, using um, uh, this technology uh, combined with what they're um, researching, exploring, and what may be on the cards uh, from the outset to do with all the taxpayers' money being used 
uh, in uh, at CERN and in developing that technology I don't think they're just trying to basically split the particles uh, and discover other <coughs> other uh, elements but rather um, they're trying to um, tear the fabric of t uh, 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 the, the dimension that separates uh, mankind from these other entities and uh, like I said I mean the timing of which is very interesting another thing I want you guys to scroll a line under because what I'm telling you is stuff that you can basically in person verify uh, 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 and what I'm going to tell you right now you uh, you certainly can verify is every time you see a coronal mass ejection now we've discussed in previous videos that we see uh, weather anomalies, extreme weather anomalies occur. Every time our sun is unhappy, it shoots out a huge CME. The magnetic uh, 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 um, waves from the sun reach our atmosphere and the particulates from that uh, 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 wave then enter through our atmosphere and cause, uh, 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 disturb uh, the climate as it were as well as our magnetic poles and then uh, basically reach all the way down to our iron core and upset the core as well which then basically p creates these sort of earthquakes and stuff that we witness uh, in terms of um, uh, volcanic eruptions and stuff and there seems to be a direct correlation and a, hu a very 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 direct pattern that we've discussed and recently we've had CMEs again and we've seen Hurricane Matthew and other things develop on the ground and I, I, I'm pretty sure that we're going to experience a few more uh, extreme earthquakes very soon um, uh, 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 in the next few days if anything uh, if we go off that same model and um, the pattern uh, that's been occurring uh, in uh, uh, previously anyway so um, it, this it, 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 CERN seem to basically be able to harness and know how to harness that um, uh, the uh, the energy that comes from the CMEs because every time the CME occurs what I've noticed and you can verify this a lot of activity takes place in terms of uh, uh, within CERN and when I say activity I'm not talking about staff uh, running around CERN but actual results for uh, the uh, the um, uh, with the collider and um, uh, uh, there seems to be a huge amount of activity uh, during those times so it seems like maybe perhaps they've, they've, uh, they're aware of uh, the energy uh, that can be harnessed when these CMEs occur and they actually um, tap into that energy simply because the Sun is a huge source of energy we've uh, uh, at least conventionally we've not learned or we've not been told that we can potentially harness the energy other than just a few uh, solar um, um, panels but um, uh, there seems to be other ways to harness that energy and um, don't forget CERN requires a lot a lot a lot of electricity a lot of energy to um, uh, um, um, run it so I mean uh, and I guess there's no limit to this kind of um, uh, 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 energy that CERN requires and um, the sun would be a very good source if they could if could, they could learn how to harness that. And I'm assuming they already know how to do it, you know. Uh, uh, and they've known uh, that the CMEs are actually uh, the cause for the sort of uh, climate changes we're seeing. And they don't want, uh, for the best part, uh, through conventional science, want to educate the masses about the relationship between the sun and our climate. Because uh, if they did, again, uh, we'd be looking to the sun and the activity on the sun and then uh, making a connection between our climate and then, let's say, for instance, like how we've seen our climate getting much more extreme, we'd then uh, look to what's upsetting the sun and why so much activity towards the sun. And then, we'd, I guess, more people would be looking at the skies. And as more people do that, more people are going to become aware of the sort of anomalies, the clocking devices, the sun simulating devices, uh, uh, simulators that they're using uh, and the sort of holographic technology that's available to them and the patents that NASA has got and uh, how they seem to be um, uh, uh, using that uh, as we speak right now so I mean uh, they don't want they want to basically keep our gazes at eye level rather than look above in the heavens and discover exactly what and how and what they're doing anyway so let's let's continue I'm uh, sorry I went off on a tangent 
And when you increase the number of these devices, you, every time you add one of these qubits, you double the number of these parallel universes that you have access to. Until such time when you get to a chip like this, which is about 500 of these bits, you have something like 2 to the 500th power of these guys living in that chip. So the way I think about it is that the shadows of these parallel worlds... Very interesting. Two to the five, power, two to uh, to the five hundred power of these guys living in these. You know, it's it's almost like he's giving it. Uh, it's almost like we are talking about entities now, right? And then he's talking about these shadow worlds and shadows from a different dimension. And we basically, when these entities come into our reality, they they, they most often not do come in shadows. In fact, the score line underneath it, out of the triumph part one, I think, or part two that I've uploaded, and I've given a reference in the description box of that particular upload where you can actually go to the original source for that video of the unveiling of Arc the Triumph at um, uh, London Trafalgar Square, and you'll see a shadow, a black shadow, two of them, um, and both demonic uh, forces as far as I'm concerned, and one of them actually... Um, ceremoniously go through the arch and the other one uh, basically rests on one of the pillars on the um, on the um, Babylonian, Babylonian type of uh, architectural building in the foreground right and uh, uh, the third pillar there um, again score a line underneath that and make a note, notepad and uh, uh, visit that video and check that original source yourself and see whether there is in fact a dark shadow uh, um, which basically comes into the scene from the left hand uh, side right hand side of the top of the screen and goes all the way through I've even given a, I'm pretty sure I've even given a timestamp of exactly when that occurs overlap with ours and if we're smart enough we can dive into them and grab their resources and pull them back into ours now that's interesting so you go into another dimension, you basically uh, uh, grab their resources and pull them back into our dimension. Now, interesting enough, I just want you to, I want to take you guys off on a tangent again. But you'll see, um, like, uh, these magicians, where they make things appear and reappear. Now, for those who, of you who are, uh, again, Muslims, you'll understand that they're using very dark forces and they're working with dark forces. There's nothing, you know, in fact, we go back to the... Um, the um, um, the sorcerers at the time of Pharaoh, Pharaoh uh, and um, uh, Moses, Musa alayhi salam, and we understand that there was basically a face-off between Musa alayhi salam and the sorcerers there, and the sorcerers basically um, um, uh, made their, uh, caused their staffs as an illusion. It was an illusion of the eye, but they caused their staffs to become snakes, and we understand that they were working with dark forces. And then uh, Moses was instructed to throw down his staff, and his staff became a snake, and his snake devoured the illusion of all the other sorcerers. And the sorcerers then basically conceded to the fact that Moses was on the true path, representing the true divine uh, 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 creator. And they basically um, accepted the message of Moses, alayhi salam, may peace be upon him, um, uh, uh, and um, basically... Um, uh, reneged uh, on the message of Pharaoh and basically um, uh, drew, uh, well, uh, separated from their alliance with Pharaoh and basically um, uh, realigned themselves, well, aligned themselves with uh, the uh, with Moses, uh, peace be upon him. So we understand that these sort of um, uh, beings um, exist and that. Uh, these magicians work with these forces and these magicians then come and basically they cause uh, things to appear and reappear it's almost like they come from a dimension in fact even through your body you know they can make things I mean you've seen I've seen um, uh, some footage of these magicians uh, having coins basically literally run through the course of the, below their skin right and then they literally make a small incision and then that coin comes out of there. Now how that coin entered and how it moves through their skin, and this is a very real event occurring, can only be explained by maybe uh, another 
entity that exists in another dimension and can enter and flow. And don't forget, we understand that uh, Iblis Lanatullahi, um, uh, uh, Satan Lanatullahi, uh, 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 basically, whilst he was fearsome of Adam alayhi salam, and uh, 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 when Adam was fashioned by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, he remained, from what I understand, in the form of a statue, right? Before any uh, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, God, uh, placed a soul uh, in him, right, which basically entered from uh, uh, his uh, head all the way down to uh, uh, the rest of his body, and uh, Adam al Islam came to life. Okay, so we understand that at that time, whilst he was just in the form of a statue in clay, uh, a sounding clay, this is when Shaitan Lanatullah lay basically, even though he was fearful because he understood that Adam al Islam. Uh, was basically created and his progeny were created for a great cause right and not only that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala God created you know most of uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's creation from the uh, little knowledge that I've got and um, don't quote me on this I certainly can be incorrect uh, 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 but from what I understand was created by the Amr by the the will you know, by the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whereas Adam alayhi salam was actually fashioned by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, so there seems to be a very direct relationship between, uh, and a, a, a shaitan alayhi understood that there, there was a great purpose for uh, his alayhi salam's creation. Uh, yet he was fearful of uh, Adam alayhi salam, uh, yet he approached the statue of Adam alayhi salam and he went through it. And he felt that um, uh, uh, he, 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 he almost um, um, uh, felt justified in his position, in the position he had taken, uh, uh, and became very jealous of uh, Adam al Islam, but felt that uh, he, he's just made out of clay and it's a weak creation. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, God always knew best uh, what the purpose behind. And everything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has within Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's knowledge is, is absolute uh, perfection. You know, there's no margin of error in that, none whatsoever. It's an absolute science, it's an absolute math, it's an absolute um, uh, um, um, uh, it's an absolute. And, um, uh, you know, that's where basically uh, for Muslims and Islam, that's basically where it ends. But what I'm trying to say, uh, refer to over here is that you had Iblis basically enter. And then we understand that um, we've been told that uh, he, Allah has sworn as the enemy of mankind that he will enter in their bodies. Uh, well, actually, we've been told in, uh, Islamically that they enter in our bodies like our blood runs through our veins. Okay. So they have this ability to enter through what we understand and walk through um, uh, physical uh, uh, um, matter, right? And um, then you've got these uh, this individual talking about how you can now, so he's reversing it. We understand they can walk in physical matter and they can actually bring things. Don't forget there was a jinn in the time of Suleiman alayhi salam. And interesting enough, the uh, Masons, astaghfirullah, believe that uh, uh, Prophet Solomon, Suleiman alayhi salam, was a high degree Mason. And that's absolute nonsense. Where Islam stands and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has clearly stated in the Quran, in his Qalam, that um, uh, uh, Suleiman alayhi salam was not a magician. He was actually a true messenger. Okay, And he was on the truth. And uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him dominion over all realities so the uh, the the jinn kind and mankind he had absolute sovereignty no one has had the sort of rulership and sovereignty given to Suleiman Ali Salam in the history of mankind ever that was granted to Adam, uh, Suleiman Ali Salam in fact he not only over mankind and jinn kind but even the animal kingdom right he literally was given uh, uh, sovereignty over all right and power overall and um, we understand that the jinn kind in fact when Suleiman Ali Salam had um, uh, um, 
he was he instructed the jinn to build a, a structure, a building, and whilst it was, uh, and because he had the power vested in him, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala granted that power and ability. The jinn kind had to do exactly as he would instruct, and they were very fearful of him, and uh, uh, they continued building these buildings. And I understand from my limited knowledge again that um, uh, 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 Sulaiman alayhi salam, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala took his um, soul during this time whilst he was resting on his staff, sat down. And um, his soul was taken, and the jinn kind didn't know, weren't aware of this, and they continued going about their la laborious uh, uh, task of building this um, structure, uh, uh, while thinking that uh, uh, Prophet Suleiman, Alaihissalam, was basically still uh, supervising and watching them, uh, uh, and it was the ants, uh, 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 I think termites, uh, which basically started nibbling away at the staff. Uh, of Suleiman, and when that staff was basically um, the uh, was um, had um, been eaten away at, it uh, uh, Suleiman uh, uh, was using that as a support. His his body was, and he fell to the ground, and that's when the jinn kind realized that he had um, uh, passed away. Uh, uh, and um, uh, we understand that the jinn had the capability of lifting. Uh, uh, structures and moving structures and don't forget in the time of Suleiman Ali Salam when the um, Queen of Sheba uh, had uh, almost um, challenged Suleiman's, uh, Suleiman Ali Salam's um, sovereignty he asked one of the jinns to go because uh, they were fire worshippers right uh, it was I think the um, I think it was the Hopi bird right uh, which in the Quran and uh, conversed uh, it was late at the, at the meeting where uh, Suleiman al-Islam had called all uh, 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 all manners of um, uh, uh, attendees to attend and the bird was one of them and that bird uh, was late so uh, Suleiman, the Prophet Suleiman al-Islam reprimanded that bird and the bird responded by saying that they were fire worshippers and uh, these fire worshippers weren't worshipping, uh, they were worshipping the fire and I was astonished at this Right, uh, uh, so basically, I thought I'd eavesdrop uh, uh, and report back to you, and this is why I was delayed. And that's when Suleiman al Islam then basically um, goes to uh, sends a message to the Queen of Sheba, uh, uh, inviting her to the monotheistic religion, the oneness of God, and uh, his message. Uh, and uh, she basically um, um, was. And was uh, told to accept the message, or otherwise uh, Suleiman al Islam would basically um, uh, would challenge her her rule. So, um, in order to safeguard her people, she came to visit uh, Suleiman al Islam. So, Suleiman al Islam then wanted her throne uh, to be um, brought to Suleiman al Islam before the Queen of Sheba even arrived to uh, Jerusalem, right? And um, one of the jinns, many volunteered, but one jinn said that I have the ability. By the time you blink, uh, uh, I'll, I'll basically carry that throne and bring it back to you, uh, back here. So what that tells us is a being from a different reality and different dimension can not only come into our reality, but they can basically manipulate, carry, and move physical objects, right? And they can then maybe perhaps even move them, uh, uh, take them into their dimension, right? And uh, uh, we see that. We see many examples of that and lesser examples of that through these magicians today who work with these dark forces and when they basically signed their souls away to these dark forces, to Shaitan Nanakulayale. So it's interesting that he's talking about how we can now, in reverse, go into another reality, which would be, let's say, the Jinkind's reality, and then maybe bring something back from there in as much as the Jinkind can bring something back, uh, take something from our reality into theirs, and move it and bring it back into our reality. So, for instance, move a mobile phone into a glass bottle um, uh, by a magician and then that mobile phone bring it back out again, out of the glass bottle. So it moved from one dimension to another, entered the glass bottle and then was drawn back out of it again. So, I mean, there seems to be some ability to manipulate the physical uh, 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 laws, the laws of physics as we understand it as mankind when we apply our logic and we can't explain it. So it seems like these dark forces are working uh, uh, it, uh, within these dimensions whilst these sort of things occur. And again, like it's interesting that they're trying to reverse the reality uh, and see if they can basically uh, do the uh, exact same but with 
be uh, with the other dimension and see if they can bring things from that dimension into our reality. To make an effect in our world. Now this may sound very odd to you and bizarre, and in fact I am using language that a normal theoretical physicist probably wouldn't use, but this is, what I'm telling you is absolutely correct and in line with the way that these things actually work. We've been doing this for some time now, and in fact we have our own version of Moore's Law. The doubling uh, of the number of these qubits on the chip has happened once a year for the past nine years. So for the last nine years, every year, the number of these qubit devices has doubled and it will continue to do so. As a point of reference, in terms of how fast these things are, in one generation of chip, the one from the, the system that was installed at USC to the one that Google and NASA have now, the speed of the device went up by almost a half a million. This is the kind of progress that you're going to see with these types of machines going forward. That's exponential, by the way. It's exponential. And half a million sounds like an abstract number, but I put up a, a little mental comparison here to see what 5,000 really means. 5, 500,000 is a big number when it comes to speed. All right, so now I'm getting into the last part of my talk where I'm going to make some predictions, some dangerous predictions. So predictions are very dangerous for a variety of reasons. Uh, often they're wrong, which is one. Um, but I think they're important because predictions somehow are our internal desires made manifest. Predictions are about what we want to happen, maybe not what will happen. And I'm going to make three predictions, and all of them are dangerous in the sense that they're very unlikely to happen, maybe, but I think that there's a very good chance that they may. As an aside, I just wanted to say that at least in the, in the valley, Silicon Valley, and maybe in the United States in general, there's a very deep feeling of unease about the way technology has been developing. Because we have all of these vast array of very smart people, and what they're doing is crap. They're building things that cannot last. They're building things that are not important. This is a little bit of a controversial point of view, but I believe it. But I think that the reason for this is it's low-hanging fruit. Computers haven't been around for a long time. And I think that what's going to happen is that as people get more comfortable with computers, the attention will turn from the Twitters and the Facebooks to very important things. So here's my first prediction. I'm going to predict that by five years, NASA will have found an Earth-like uh, planet with Earth-like atmosphere and water on it, and serious people will start discussing how we get there. Earth-like planet? <clears throat> so life can exist on it? And water is certainly an element required for life. So um, it's an interesting plug-in. And by the way, they're going to use one of our machines to help do this. So that's my first prediction. My second prediction is that this business of parallel universes is going to turn out to be very important. This picture that I've got under here is, is what's called a gravitational lens. When Einstein proposed his general theory of relativity, it came... Isn't that interesting? We've been talking about the gravitational lens and what's been happening around the sun, and some of you who basically have been on the WhatsApp um, science distribution list... Uh, will recollect that I shared um, uh, certain images of the sun which had a halo around it and we discussed how a very dense object seems to be behind the sun. Now in retrospect I would say that dense object was that proton neutron star which was bending the light and causing this halo that which was then being seen in our atmosphere uh, around the sun. I, sent, I shared an image of that but then google it and you find a halo around the sun you don't have to look far you'll find as a plethora of images uh, populated on Google uh, uh, by individuals who uploaded that uh, 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 capturing the same phenomena world over. It's absolutely crazy how many of them uh, have been basically captured by people yet not made the mainstream media. But they did basically try to explain it away as the um, uh, ice crystals in our atmosphere. Interesting enough, um, above uh, our atmosphere, um, ISS was still picking it up which is above in space, uh, looking directly at our sun, there was still a halo there. 
and a space happens we've been told at least it happens to be a vacuum and in a vacuum ice crystals can't really exist around the sun well they wouldn't exist around the sun anyway the sun's obviously uh, putting out heat so ice can't hmm, interesting anyway came with a bunch of experiments that you could use to test it and one of them was that if there was a point of light very far away in a galaxy in the middle that galaxy should bend the light and you should see a ring and this was eventually observed and I think what's going to happen is somebody is going to come up with an experiment to test this reality of these things and we're going to actually whilst we're discussing that we might as well see it for ourselves shall we okay so sun halo there you go and this is exactly what we're seeing and it's interesting that the sun is a funny shape but anyway let's take a look at some other images this is exactly what I shared with you guys I saw it myself uh, this these sort of images were very worrying because this was suggesting multiple kind of um, 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 objects causing uh, these different halos okay in the sky um, Again, so it's it's very similar to what he just discussed, uh, but what he mentioned was a star having a galaxy in front of it, and a galaxy would be quite dense uh, in and of itself, and that would cause the light to bend. And if you use the same principle, then if there was something just behind our sun which was quite dense, it would bend the light of our sun, causing this sort of a bubble, a halo around it, just like the one that he mentioned. And this is a gravitational lens effect that we discussed. Uh, and researchers were drawing our attention to this and it was a very 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 um, I think an accurate summary of what was actually happening and look at this it's been picked up everywhere yet how many times have you <laughs> had any mention of it the only time they've actually had to basically try and explain it away they got, they said it was ice crystals but if I show you ISS Sun Halo SS, SS images, come on. Someone's got to have it somewhere here. Um, Jeff, he ISS Sun Okay, it's certainly on one of my video uploads anyway, so take a look at that and um, you'll find it there. I just for the life of me can't seem to find it here. Um, but they, again, the ISS picked it up as well um, and um, it's on the video that I've uploaded, one of the videos, so please just search through the archive, you'll find it somewhere there. ...be able to do so. My third prediction that I'm going to end on is the most important of all. I believe that humanity is on the cusp of the most important technological, societal uh, revelation, revolution that's ever occurred. And that's when we got to the point where the machines that we build outpace us in every respect. I don't mean that they're better calculators. I don't mean that they're better at searching. I mean everything. And I think that we're very close. And my prediction is that within 15 years, we will have machines that outpace humans in everything. Thank you very much. Okay, guys. So I mean, that's certainly not something to be proud of. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be applauding the individual um, if I was there uh, uh, um, and this was being discussed. If anything had been discussed, I mean, uh, it's it's man trying to play God. And I was early. Anyway, um, it was an interesting um, uh, upload, and, uh, and I I see a relationship between these three um, organizations. Uh, one is the technology for D wave and quantum computing, the other is CERN, and then the third would be um, uh, NASA, 
uh, along with um, uh, Google uh, as a partner uh, in this whole kind of um, um, gender to tear through the uh, 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 different dimensions. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best again. Jazakallah khayran wa asana al-jazakallah for your time. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu.